We're pleased to be uh, invited here. Uh, been in Buenos Aires just once, 10 years ago, when I was had a sabbatical in Chile. It's nice to be able to, to come here, even if it was a bit, even if it was a bit of an adventure. Um, and I'm told to some people about that. Anyway, what I'm like, uh, I'm actually a retired professor uh, from the University of Bern. So it's nearly two years now. And since then, I'm just been having fun. Uh, and I've been working for a former PhD student of mine, Tudor Gearbelt, as this amazing little company called Fink. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about what uh, we've been working on. So Fink has been developing this platform for uh, software and data analysis called Glamorous Toolkit. But the cornerstone of the whole platform, we try to understand what the platform is and what it does. It's kind of missing the point. As you look at the technology, you say, oh, it's this, oh, it's that, it's a new IDE, oh, it's all notebook-based system itself. But all of that misses the point. What Fink is really doing is working on this idea called multiple development. We believe that's sort of the cornerstone of how it really should be building software systems. So multiple development is all about developing your software and your systems so that they are explainable, so that you can understand it. We can talk to the systems, ask questions, and get answers back. That means you have to build these systems in a particular way. So multiple development is also a bit of a, a mystery. And uh, we've also realized that over the years that uh, we can actually explain, I think, multiple development in terms of a bunch of design patterns. This is a kind of our first attempt to try and uh, explain that. So what I'm going to do today is um, first give you a very brief introduction to multiple development with a couple of examples. I'll be using the Lamnas Toolkit, uh, but don't focus too much on the technology. Try and get your head wrapped around what we're trying to do. So if there's actually a bit of a paradigm shift, and this works really well in small talk, because small talk is already very close to what we want to do, but there are things that are different. So it's, it's, it's not your grandfather's small talk anymore. Uh, they're doing uh, some things a little bit different, although I think you'll recognize a lot of the ideas. So multiple development is really about um, supporting decision-making, helping you understand the software systems and the data that you're working with by making concepts explainable. Now, in order to help you understand that, let's step back and look at uh, how you usually have to deal with software systems. So this is a little example of a, a, a Ludo game that was developed that uh, first-year computer science students in uh, the University of Bern were developing in Java. And, you know, if you want to try and understand something that somebody has built, you can do two things. You can uh, play with the system. So here you have the running application. And, hello. Ah, yes, it is working. A demo effect, I thought. So I can... Click up the die, and uh, it says player A cannot move, and we can click on it again. It's this. And eventually, we we'll, might get a, uh, a six, and we could actually move forward. This is a little bit boring, uh, but that's all we can do with the running application. The running application, you see the user interface, but you can't really talk to it to understand how it's working. Then, what you can do, is you can go to the source code. So this is a more or less conventional with uh, the coder in GT, uh, and we can explore. It looks a little bit different from the usual system browser, but a lot of concepts are recognizable. So we can see the packages. We can see there's a whole bunch of classes here, the system here, the model classes. So we see, oh, there's a die, and there's a like, game, and there's a move, and there's a player. Make that a little bit larger. Or we can browse the classes and see Oh, yeah, there's a, a game object, and it has players. We need to look at its slots uh, and see. Hello. The uh, table here is a little bit sticky, and I have some problems goofing the mouse. Uh, so we can see what slots it has, and we can navigate back and forth. We can navigate to super classes of all this stuff. But, you know, where do you start? It's this disconnect. You have the running application, and you've got the source code. Oh, you could run tests, of course, but you know there's this, this gap between an, in knowledge in terms of what the running system is doing and what the static source code is doing. So think of a different way of interacting with the system. 
So I used to call it object-oriented program, and this bugged me for years because the development environments aren't object-oriented, they're class-oriented. You stare at source code, and you, you type away, and eventually you run something, you run some tests, or you run the application, and then you can see the live objects. But what you're working with is, is source code. So, well, we have inspectors in, uh, in all programming languages. Usually you only see them until you end up there in the debugger uh, because something breaks or you're running a test that fails. Um, but imagine that you have an inspector. The usual inspector is going to look something like this, right? And suppose you have an inspector that allows you to talk to the real object, but instead of just having this generic view, you can actually look at it. You can look at this is the same running game here, and I can interact with it. Player A is supposed to roll the die, and player A is supposed to move, so now I can actually play the game and move. But I have all sorts of other views as well. I can ask the game, hey, who are the players here? Okay, there's a player A, and it's got a, a two tokens, a big A and a little A token, and we can see what states they're in. And we could dive in there and have a look at the, these two tokens up there, so you can see the, the, the big B and the little B and where they are. And we can inspect those guys too and see what the individual tokens are. There's one of the tokens, so we can see where it is on the board and dive in. We could also look at the squares on the board and see them listed in kind of a it's a very simple, there are only two players there at the moment. We can look at the moves that have been played so far. So here, for example, there have been uh, uh, six moves. C. Yeah, so there have been uh, six moves so far, and we can look and see what were they. Well, it took a while before D actually got a six, and then what happened? Oh, well, moved one of his tokens into the game. And we can browse through back at time and back and forth, and we can try to get some understanding of how the game runs. Furthermore, we've actually talked to this object which will surprise you with the small, small talkers here, but we can uh, say self uh, auto play, and we could say Rahim 10 moves here. Well, let's have a look at the a board as well. So we could actually run this, and a whole bunch more moves are run here. Let's run all the way to the end. Let's run 100 moves, another 100 moves, 100, okay, player D. So how many moves have we got here? that can go all the way to pretty much the end of the game and see where we were. Player B moved, and then player C moved, and then D got lucky and got a two and went in. You got this. Interact with it in a much more meaningful way than just clicking or, or running tests. You can interact with this uh, game and understand it. Um, and you might say, wow, isn't that an awful lot of work to set up all these inspectors to, to look like that? Actually, that's not the case. Here's the entire implementation of the move view. See, it's just a little method here that takes a view as an argument. It has a pragma that says it's a view called GT view. And in this case, uh, it's an explicit view. Remember, we already had a user interface. Well, in GT, we have a, a very nice graphics framework where everything uh, is in one rendering tree. So we can reuse any graphical element anywhere. We already have that nice view, so we can plug it in here. And we can reuse it in different contexts. We have other kinds of views, like uh, this is our moves view. And it's similarly a little bit more complicated, but not much. So most of these methods are, are quite short. So that's an example for a, a simple little game. What we've discovered is really, what we'd be testing for years is where can you apply multiple development? Our, our hypothesis is that you can apply it anywhere. We've used it heavily for building GT itself. We've worked with many different kinds of customers. We've yet to come to a place where you cannot apply multiple development. Basically, as you saw, the simple idea is you want to interact directly with objects. You want to extend these objects to make them uh, explainable. In this case, we're looking at uh, custom views. So we're molding the environment. We have tools like inspectors, which we can extend with different views. There are other ways you can extend the inspector, and there are other ways you, you can extend other tools. That's what we mean by molding. 
The idea is that you do this not starting from the static development environment, but from live that you track as you use. So you're always talking to an object, you're interacting with it, you find you may have to work to answer a question. Once you've discovered how to answer that question, you pull that up and you turn it into an extension of some existing tool in the environment. So then it becomes part of the system that makes itself more explainable. But it sounds pretty mysterious, but I hope with the help of patterns, I could show you that it's not really all that complicated. There's some things that you have to do differently, but basically multiple development becomes a very natural but slightly different way of developing. Here's a completely different example. So the Ludo game was an example that I, uh, I prepared for my successor at the University of Bern. He teaches the first year Java students, and I wanted to give uh, the students a lecture showing how the exercise they did uh, could be done in a very different way with another object-oriented uh, Langton system. Uh, and uh, for my successor also has a uh, Timo Kerr, he also has a compiler construction for us. So I said, well, we can also show how in the domain of uh, language implementation, you can also uh, apply multiple development in a very natural way. So in the compiler construction course, he has a little language called SPL. He called it structured programming language. It could be simple programming language. So it's a simple, more or less straight line programming language with the uh, it's just some simple loops, nothing complicated, no functions or objects or classes, but so they can significantly complex or rich that you can write some real programs. So here's a factorial program in SPL. Well, you can apply uh, multiple development here as well. So actually, we have three views here, which are, uh, which are uh, combined into one. We have the continuation, so the current, the current state of the program is a continuation, which gets rewritten. We have the AST of the program, which we can browse as well. Here again, I'm inspecting a context of SPL. So this is a, a live thing. I can look at the current environment of bindings, and I can look at the current output from our program. And these are all empty. And I thought, well, it's much cooler to have this in, uh, in a combined view. Now we have custom actions. So I can actually do a one-step semantic step uh, of execution of this continuation, which will take the first line of that program and assign uh, five to the argument arg. And then we'll update her environment, as you see here, and reduce the, uh, the code to simply five. And if I do another step, that'll just get eaten up. So you see our continuation updates, our environment updates, and the output updates. And I could run through this whole thing. And now the whole program was run to the end. We get our output 120. And you say, yeah, okay, but did I understand how it worked? Well, we saw the input output that so off, but we can go through the history as we did before with the Ludo game. So that's another kind of a, a pattern that comes up often, but it's not really a multiple development pattern. It's just a stateless uh, uh, pattern. So here again, you can go back in time and we could step through and see what happens. What's a while loop? Well, a while loop simply gets expanded, rewritten, to it and it's then else with an embedded while. So if you're a language person, which I guess many of you are, you understand what's going on here. So what we got here, these, these guys, they're pretty small. They're pretty simple. Here's the, the, the view implementation. They're, it's not so complex. With maybe an afternoon or a couple of afternoons of effort, I could take my little SPL implementation and really get essentially back in time with debugger for free just by applying multiple development. Okay, so those were two examples. You can say, okay, they were both toy examples and I'll show you a lot of toy examples. It's hard to show something real, but we'll see a couple of things which are a bit closer to real. Check my time. Okay, um, so how can I explain to you how multiple development works? Thought about this a fair bit and realized uh, when I was working with some, uh, I was also working with a PhD student from Chile and uh, Bern, where he was analyzing GitHub actions. And I said, great, we can really use GT as your research vehicle so that you can explore and, um, and um, analyze what's happening with GitHub actions. I won't go into detail, so it's interesting enough. I can tell you about it offline if you want to know. And as I was working with him, mentoring him, showing, well, how do you do this? 
he, he started noticing and saying, oh yeah, you're always doing that. Because what you would tend to go like we always do, we tend to start programming in the text editor, the code editor, and also in GT. My tendency often at the beginning was to go and start editing code, which is the wrong thing to do. So uh, I'd say this is the hardest pattern to learn, and that's why it's at the very top left. It's, uh, it's called moldable object. So it says, don't start from the text editor. Start from an instance of the object that you are developing. And you continue to mold it and incrementally develop it. Now, we all know that in Smalltalk, you can edit code in the debugger, but you tend to only update code if you actually get an error or an exception. But what if that were the normal way of working? So the idea of moldable object is start your moldable develop. You don't have to, but it's going to be way more effective if the first thing you do is you create a moldable object, and then you start extending it. Then there are a whole bunch of other patterns which are closely related to that. So there's contextual playground. We'll see that shortly. Once you have an object, you can directly interact with it. Uh, once you have code that's working, so you can experiment it, you can extract it, turn it into method, turn it into more views and so on. Once you have that, you can create new views. You can create custom actions like the buttons that would step through the execution of our toy programming language and so on. So uh, I don't know how many of these patterns I'll show you. I have them all prepared. I'll probably run out of time. But I'll try and show you, give you a taste uh, of a number of them. So I'll start just going linearly. And when I'm running out of time, then I'll skip ahead to the tailwinds. And of course, I'll be around all week. So I'm happy to talk more about any of this stuff with you. By the way, all of this uh, information is inside GT. When you download it, you'll be able to, you'll find documentation about all of this stuff inside the system itself. Uh, related to that, tomorrow I'll be around for Camp Smalltalk. I'd be happy to give people tours of GT or whatever you're interested in. And on Wednesday at the end of the day, I'll be doing a two-hour workshop. So if people are interested in really following along, I encourage you to download GT before them at gtoolkit.com and then we can play together and, uh, and, uh, and go step by step. Okay, so let's take a closer look at some of these patterns. Uh, I stupidly didn't think of getting a glass of water for myself. Somebody, my hero, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to start with moldable object and have a look at this pattern. It's really fundamental. It's the most important one. I think it's the one that's hardest to really understand or, or assimilate. But basically, it's, it's not that complicated. So the ad, is that readable, or shall I zoom in a little bit? Zoom in? Is that? So, um, multiple object says that you want to start from an actual instance, because then you can do things. So suppose that instance doesn't even exist. Well, no problem. So here, I have a, 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 a toy application I'd like to do. I'd like to implement a little stack machine so that I can simulate the reverse Polish notation calculator, like an old HP calculator. So what I do is I start, this is actually a notebook page um, in the, the Glamour Toolkit book uh, in a system called Lepeter. And there you can have code and, and text and all sorts of other kinds of snippets in your, uh, in your pages. And they're all linked together like a, um, uh, like, um, like a wiki. So here I've written a little snippet that says this SM is an instance of a new stack machine called my stack machine. And well, I haven't even created that class yet. It doesn't matter. Start from something that doesn't work and make it work. It makes you start thinking of test-driven development. Actually, we have something else called example-driven development. But it will start immediately from something which is an example like a test. Although that will come up too. You're my year of anger. <laughs> Wait. Okay, so if you see a little wrench here, that's saying this class doesn't exist, so we have a fix it. So let's just create my stack machine, and we need to at least give it a, a package. Uh, so let's call that uh, 
I can't type so small terms. And done. Okay, so now we actually have some valid half our code. So let's just inspect that. So we have, we can play it or we can inspect it, we can debug it and so on. So we're gonna inspect it. I'll often use keyboard shortcuts. And now we have an instance here. So uh, from this instance, we get a, a default view. So it has no interesting views because this class didn't exist before. But we can, we can browse it, but it's still not interesting. So what we'd actually like to do is we can go now to the code view. This is the meta view, which we get for free. And we can uh, create an initialize method. And we can initialize its slot to be, and we all know it should be an ordered collection, right? We want to ordered collection. That looks good. And of course that's invalid, so we need to fix it. Uh, oops. There, that should be a slot. Hello. Okay, so now we've updated that guy. And I guess what we should do is say self-initialize. Build up with me. And? Did I do something wrong? New to your collector. Oh, yes. Yeah? Yeah. I can't think when I'm uh, on, uh, on the front. So did I do something? Yes, I made a mistake. Hello. Yeah, yes. I don't want an order collection. I want it. You. That's what happens when you're... You. And let's do that again. Yes, that's much better. And now we should have an instance of an ordered collection here. Hello. Yes. Okay. No. Um. I see you didn't send the initialize again. Ah, I thought I did. Maybe you did save the the memory. Change. Yeah, you're right. Somehow that didn't get saved. So now, now it should be okay. Yeah, okay, now it looks good. And if we go to this guy, then we get a completely generic view of the, of the ordered collection. So, so far, still not terribly exciting. But as you saw, you, once you have an object, you can both see it and update it live uh, and interact with it in that way. So you know what you're getting when you, when you write some code. So we saw immediately there was something wrong with it, and then we went back and, and fixed the code. Okay. This is a really important matter, and I've... ...that begins to bother you, you say, what am I doing wrong here? Um, uh, come at the very end in the takeaways to an example where I realized that I wasn't applying multiple development to uh, to fundamental part of my, my work. So we saw with the moldable object, we have this contextual playground. We have playgrounds everywhere. There, we had playgrounds in the, um, in the notebook, but we also have the playground associated with, um, with an object. And what is cool, so here we've been working with our stack machine for a bit. And, um, oh, by the way, this is another kind of a snippet here. This is a, um, an, uh, an example snippet. So I actually have turned the version zero of the stack machine into an example object that I plug in. We'll see the example object pattern a little bit later. And this snippet is now embedded. So inside this notebook page, we have a, uh, a live object here. So what we can do is, oh, well, I should have done this first. So we want to be able to um, update the stack and push something at the end. Let's suppose we don't remember how to do that. Well, then we can go to the meta view and start talking to the ordered collection class and say, well, what kind of add methods do you have? And there seems to be a whole bunch here. And there's add first and add all the last and eventually we, 
there's a bit of a problem because of my small screen estate, screen real estate. But eventually we find it, oh yeah, add loss, that looks pretty good. So let's get uh, a view of this guy over here. So there's a, another view of the same guy. And if we do an add last three, that should update our raw view. And we haven't done anything fancy yet. So here we can see that it's actually doing what we wanted to do. And the view is pretty clunky, but we can, we can see it here. And if we add last to four and do that as well, this guy doesn't update automatically yet because if we haven't set up any announcements or anything, we can see, okay, that's doing what we'd like to do. So we actually like that. And notice um, stack is a private slot to our, uh, our stack machine, right? We didn't create any accessors, but this code is working because the playground here is bound to the context of the live object. So we can write code that will work in a method. And furthermore, we can extract this method now and call this self uh, push colon something, or actually I'd like just to call it, well, oh, um, sorry. Uh, what I'd like to do is make that parameter. So let's add an N. And now I can extract it and it knows it has an argument. And I'll, I'll call it bang because that's a name I like. And we'll refactor that. And we could see here in the, uh, in the meta view that we now have this new operator. So we can self bang five, for example, and we still don't have a very nice view of our, uh, any nice views, but we're, we're making some progress. So we have, um, we have this contextual playground and generally the idea is when you're trying to answer questions or figure out how you ought to continue your, de your development, you're doing a lot of coding in the contextual playground of the object or perhaps some object that you can navigate to. And once you find code that you like, you've pulled it up or sometimes extract and make new methods and eventually pull it up to the object itself. So you're always working with something live and you can see immediately the effects of the code that you're writing. Not the other way around where you're in a, a typical IDE where you write code and maybe some tests and then after a while you can run the tests and see what happens. Here it's the other way around. You experiment with the code, you see immediately the, the uh, effects, and when you like it, you can pull that up and make it a method. As we'll see later, you can then pull that up into an example method and add tests for it as well. So the, the relationship between, instead of doing test first, you're doing more example first and experimentation first. Why? Let's see. Yeah, so example logic. I'm going to go a little bit faster with some things. I want to get to the viewable entity, but let's have a look at the example object. Um, once you see an example that you like, like this guy, uh, here we have an object, uh, a new stack machine, and we want to create a new instance of this guy. So self-class view, and then we push three on it, and we push score on it, and then we want to return that example. So if we run that and inspect it, then we'll get an instance. We'd like that to be a reusable example. So uh, what we do here is, once again, we can extract that as a method, and let's call that with three and four. Okay. And... As here on the meta view. Now, normally I would put examples in a separate class, stack machine examples, but you can also put them in the class itself. This is not yet an example. <coughs> to make this an example, I would have to add the GT example pragma. And then you'll see something very cool. Now suddenly this is an executable example. So now I can play and inspect directly from the coder. Oh, what happened here? Hello. It just... You in view here.
Okay. And there's our example. Now you could do obvious things like adding assertions to, uh, to this guide. Uh, but what's also kind of cool is once you have examples in a class, you can see them directly from a view in the coder. So you have coder views as well. So you can see all the examples we have or a map of the examples. What we'll see later is you can actually compose examples. Actually, we'll probably run out of time. So that an example is just like a test except it returns an object. That means you can take the result of a test, an example, and use it as a setup for another example. So you chain them, you get a tree of examples. That runs contrary to uh, the uh, dogma of test, uh, test design, which is that tests should all be independent. Uh, that's a complete lie, as if you analyze any real test, uh, real test space, you'll see there's tons of overlaps. So the idea of examples is you refactor all of that, you can actually reuse tests, but furthermore, when you have a failing test, the most statistic test is the one that's going to be failing instead of all of the ones that depend on it. So it's much more effective as well. Uh, then, of course, from here, you can actually run all the tests. You get a test runner as well, so you can run all the examples. That's sample object. So you can see there's an affinity between uh, test-driven development and what we do in moldable development. You tend to create lots of examples, which are tests as well. Um, but instead of actually just starting from the test or the example, you're usually starting from a moldable object. So the emphasis is a little bit different. Okay, so far we still haven't built any views. We haven't done any molding. So this is where the molding comes in. Moldable object is you want to get an object in the first place. You want to be able to talk to it. You want to extract it as an example. And now we would like to be able to um, make viewable entities. So we have uh, an example stack machine that has two, uh, two things on it. And we navigate to the ordered collection. And we say, well, it's not a brilliant view, but it's a nice one. We'd actually like to see that view in our stack machine. Well, what is this thing? Let's have a look at it. It's a built-in generic view. The name of the method is GT item spore. And what kind of a view is it? It's a column list. So it has a title, which is items that we see here. And it has, uh, it has, uh, an update button here, and it's got two columns, one called index and one called item. It's really, really dead simple to build this. We could copy paste this code, but why would we do that? The view exists already. So what we do instead is, uh, let's get another view of this guy and another view of this guy. Uh, what we can do instead is we'll reuse that view. So this is something that's done very frequently. If you have a view that exists and it's good enough for now, let's just reuse it. So we'll call it GT stack. You can call it anything you like, uh, but it must take a view as an argument. It must have a GT view pragma. And then you ask the view actually create a view for you of a particular kind. We'll see in a moment there dozen or so, but maybe we won't. Uh, but one of the most common ones is called the forward view. And as a minimum, we have to give it an object. We're going to forward it to the stack. And we want a, uh, a view. And as you may recall, the view was called GT Italus for and we save that. Bang, review is there. Okay, and we can update that view by saying, for example, oh, it would be nice if the title of this guy was something a little bit more intention revealing, not tootle, uh, tootle. And we'll call it stack. And we want it to appear at the beginning of the list, so let's give it a priority up. Lives, they're arbitrary numbers. Every view has a, a number, and we'll update that, and bang, it's there. 
So once you find something you like, you turn it into a view, you slap it in, and you can see the effects immediately. This is one of the key ideas uh, as well. Uh, once you have a moldable object, you don't have to go to the coder and start coding and building these views and then go back and run something and see that it's not working and then go back and stare at the code. You work with the live object and you can go back and forth between the live object and the code in real time and see the effects. This is so much more productive than the other way of going from the coder, then trying to create an instance and see that it's not what you want and going back again. So it completely reverses this whole cycle. Let me see, what's the time now? Okay, I'll tell you about simple view and custom action, I think. And the others are a little bit, are also important, but not as important. So what kind of views are there? Um, oh yeah, let's get this guy in glory here. So this is a toy example you find in the system, which is an address book. So here we have an address book with uh, a bunch of uh, people that we know. I, I know all these people personally. And we have a contact list view. We also have a circular view. And we have, um, I'm gonna spin this a little bit bigger. Uh, we also have the usual raw view. There's also a print view, which is pretty boring in this case, since it just says cartoons, it's the default block. And the meta view, which we've seen before, which is the, uh, the code view. And the contact with details view, so actually let's start with the contact list view. That's the simplest one. It's just a plain old list. So we say to the view, hey, give me a list, and you have a list of things. Slightly more interesting is the uh, column list view. You have a bunch of columns. You can also say what the width of the column should be. And you can have arbitrary code to say, to compute what is the thing that I want to see. So often you start with the forwarding view or simple list view and they say, hey, I'd like to see more information. And you go to a column list. And as you explore, you incrementally enrich your view so that you can see more and more interesting, cool stuff or make these things live and uh, add about these and so on. This guy, the circular view, that's a little bit more esoteric. I don't use that too often. It's a Mondrian view. Uh, so Mondrian is a tool for creating uh, graph-like views. But as you can see it as well, it's not really super complicated. Let me go back to this with something else. Yeah, if you already have a graphical outlet, you can make it an explicit view. And here are some statistics. So this is on this current image. I did, wrote a little bit of code, and this is uh, um, uh, 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 another kind of a um, an element a snippet. So I can have arbitrary small talk code, and as long as it will generate the right thing, I can plug it in as a snippet. Yet. So in this current image, I have 921 empty views. An empty view is a view that does nothing. That's super useful because sometimes you have a view and you click there and, and there's nothing interesting. Well, if you know there's nothing interesting, for example, if you have a file reference and that file is an actual file and not a directory, I don't want to have the items view because that's pointless. It doesn't have any items. So the first thing that you often do in a view is say, am I this or am I that? If I'm one of those, make that view empty, make it disappear. So most of the views are empty views. 700 are forwarding views, 600 are column list views, and then a whole bunch of explicit views which are reusing things. And then there are column trees and all sorts of things with lists and some really obscure ones at the bottom. You see like the most of the ones that we have are ones that you've already seen just now and they're all pretty simple. What's the last thing? Oh yes, and this is probably the last thing I can do. Um, well, what about all of these methods? Well, well, let's find out about them. We have GTView Pragma, let's get them all. Here are all, this is a query, by the way, and you can compose queries, to compose all sorts of nice queries over the system. And this is a dedicated view, but let's switch to the, hello, to an ordinary inspector view and go to the metrics view. So now this is actually updating live, so a lot of things are calculated lazily. And uh, right now it's computing over the list of all of the methods in the system that have a GT pragma in them. And we're almost there. Oh no, it's a little bit slower today. Why is that? 
but you can see that there are thousands of methods with, uh, that are already in the system. So the system has already been heavily molded just with views, not talking about actions or other ways of molding the system. And the lines of code per method are pretty consistent, just under 12 lines of code on average. Of course, there's some very long ones, but that means lots of views are done in a few moments. So the idea is for any system that people try to sell you generic tools for analyzing software, our view has always been uh, every system is different, so you need to create your own tools. But if building tools is expensive, that won't scale. What if you can make building tools really, really, really cheap? So there are different ways you can mold the environment. These, these adaptations are all tiny little tools. Each of these views is a tool, and it should take minutes, not hours or days, to build one. Uh, and they don't need to be rocket science. So the message of simple view is a view doesn't need to be complex to be useful. So do the simplest thing, which will give you useful information. I'd like to leave lots of time for questions, and then I can show you other things. So I'm just going to slowly move ahead. Maybe I'll just tell you what these things are so that you can ask me questions if they trigger some interest. Viewable data wrapper says that uh, sometimes you don't have a greenfield application. You want to have a, um, uh, you have existing data. So here I have a website, which is GitHub Pages website. It's my own uh, website. And I would like to have a moldable view of it so I can really analyze the website and analyze the links and all these things. Uh, and the first thing I do is, in such a case, you don't want it. I can take the raw data here and inspect that, but it's just a generic file view. I could see the, the pages in this uh, small website, and I can uh, look at them. But I can't mold it because it's a file reference object. I would like to have a website object. So what do you do? You just create a new class, put the raw data in there, and now you have a moldable object that you can start adapting. So I did that uh, because I've got a bunch of different websites. Oh, why did that happen? But uh, I can show you the example running somewhere else. I'm not sure what happened. We're going to stand now, so uh, perhaps it'll go back again. No, uh, I could show it to you, uh, show it to you later. Essentially, we have a, a complete inspector view of a website showing you the pages, the links, even have an, uh, which pages are reachable or not reachable. I can dynamically connect uh, to the internet that ping pages and links to see if they exist or not. And it's cool. done exactly the same as the other examples. Uh, the tools, the views are different. But the underlying technology is very simple and it's pretty much the same. Custom actions, we saw one already, um, which was uh, adding uh, an act. So if you would like to add a, a custom action to the uh, uh, to our stack machine to uh, to do some evaluation, but we had the same thing with our uh, SDL interpreter. Uh, collection wrapper, I don't want to get into that. Let me skip over that. It's super important, but it's only once you're really diving into technology. And Project Dottery, you saw that we're starting from a notebook page. What you should do when you develop is every time you have a task, create a page and describe what you're doing. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in the GT book here, implementing the Ludo game, we have a page for all sorts of different things. Here we added some simple list views. Here we work on placing the tokens on the board. And you just have pages which are documenting what is going on. Usually you start with skeletal pages, just keeping track of what you're doing. But once your project is nearly finished, you can go back and say, oh, let's edit those pages and have some docu turn them into real documentation. So that's exactly what we did there with the Ludo game. Token. I do want to leave time for questions, so let me wrap up quickly. Uh, I have three or four takeaways. So, the idea of multiple development is that every piece, every system that you have has knowledge that's buried inside it. And when you're developing a system or extending it, 
most of the time is spent reading or trying to explore and figure out where is that information in the system. So by making your system moldable, you want to make it explainable. You want to take the information in your software, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be small talk software. We've applied it to, to uh, various other language systems. And take that out and make it explicable and visible and accessible. That's the first point. Second point, height viewable. That's just deep. Remember, so this demo fact, I don't know how many times I've been through this. Let me just quickly find what was that? Uh, what was my sent point? Oh, that was probably the broken website uh, thing. Yeah, every problem requires custom tools. But for some reason, the, the website view is broken. That's probably working in again in a minute. Uh, so every problem requires different kinds of tools. So you want tools to be cheap and easy to implement. Um, and the way you do that is to make the system itself, all of the different tools, moldable and adaptable using very simple kinds of plugins. Usually it's just a method with pragma. And uh, it's like a very simple kind of uh, 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 fluent API. You can apply multiple develop to any kind of a problem. What you see here, I was working, so this a slideshow, this slideshow is actually a class. It's this is the multiple development pattern slideshow. And I was developing this stuff from the coder. And at some point I said, this is stupid. Wait a moment, why am I not applying multiple development? So I spend an afternoon and I added all these views. So here are the slides in the system. These are the slide priorities. Here's a slideshow uh, that I can play through. There's the slide deck because each uh, slide has some uh, draft text that it might speak. There's a script that's extracted. Here's some metrics, which will do an estimation of how much time it, it takes me to do it. Here's the database of embedded uh, notebook pages that are just inside this slideshow. And here are some custom actions. So I'm not going to do that because I'm already playing the slideshow. But this one is super useful. This is the uh, Git uh, repository view. So if I update some slides, I just click on that. And then I see I, I actually made some changes right now to the slideshow. So I can, could commit those changes right now if I land. And then the last takeaway is, yeah, there is a paradigm shift. You do have to think differently. But you can learn it, and uh, we believe that these patterns could be a good way of helping people to uh, get faster on the track to learning how, how to apply manageable development to, to your problems. Okay. Thanks very much. You made me remember uh, Seraph, the language self, working with prototypes and also can please with uh, something we call, yeah, it's not working. <laughs> um, you know, something that would go and uh, the other developers is to work with, you know, prototypes. And what I see is that usually, I don't know why, and that's my question, what, what do you think about it? That we as programmers tend to generalize and to work with general tools instead of specific tools and inspectors as you showed. And have you thought about that? Why is that? And so, and also, is then this the right way to go? Are we wrong doing it the other way? What, what do you think about it? So one of the things that I find is super cool about self, which was adopted also in uh, Squeak and is in Perro as well, and in Seaside, is from Morphic. And this is something that we also put into GT. Uh, and that's that from any thing that you see, you can navigate to the code. So I can do that here as well. I want to say, well, what the heck is this, this button here? And I can drill into it. So in here, I have all of the graphical elements here in a, a, the wall tree. I can see in the left where I am. And I can dive into a particular thing and quick. Sometimes it takes a bit more work but more or less quickly find the code that's doing that thing. And that is so useful. Because sometimes you tell me, where is this done? And it's bad enough that you have uh, the model view control or the separation, but with uh, events and so on, it's sometimes it's very, very hard to track down where something is actually happening. 
And this is something which you have in self from the morphic framework, which was ported to Squeak. And you also have it in Seaside from a web page you can go back to from any kind of graphical element back to the code. So this ability to navigate between the code and the live objects is so, so important, I believe. Uh, and that's something that we, we picked up. None of the things that I showed you today in moldable development are original with us. What's original is how these all these different ideas come together to make you more... Uh, yeah, but more the, the first button, the model object, uh, it's more like working with a prototype, with a, a, a cell prototype idea and so on. So that's, that was really my question. Don't you think that we as programmers are uh, used to work with, you know, classes and generic solutions and with generic tools and if, like the inspector, no one's to the inspector or the, or, or the uh, glass browser. Those are generic tools. And mm. I think that we, we don't know, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to work with the specific tools, like the specific inspectors, or uh, a specific object. And uh, I see that you know, it's difficult for the people to, to get used to that. So my question was more related with why that could happen, and if you see that a problem too or not. Yeah, because yeah, generic tools don't get you very far. We've seen that over and over again, and also with the customers. So typically what we're doing when we're working with a new customer is we have a first uh, tool build-up phase where we try to get an initial, basically you're doing domain modeling and making the domain model explicit. Once you have an initial model of the different uh, domain entities, then you can sit together with the customer and you can see what questions they have. Say, oh, well, that's here. We can answer that. Here we can answer, oh, that we can't answer yet, but let's explore. Oh, here's the answer. Let's pull that up and we'll add a new view for you. And you should be able to do that in real time. Oh, yeah. and, and the point is that if you take off the shelf tools, and very often we see that customers are trying, struggling with these tools that they bought for lots of money, and then they're tearing their hair out and maybe seeing if they can adapt the tool, which is usually very, very painful. And we can start from the provisors that, that you build small tools you don't have a big tool that does too many things. What you want is a very simple, extensible model where you can plug in your own little tools willy-nilly as you need them. Um, hello. I have a question. Um, I was thinking about this notion of object in the programming versus class or in the programming. And my question is about your, the, the first example you showed where you first started by creating an object and then when you wanted to add a method, you went to the meta view to add it to the class. And mm -hmm. so at that point, you were interacting with the class instead of interacting with the object. Some, one thing that we usually do in Smalltalk is to program within the debugger. If you do that, you have the, like, all of the context of the method activation. So you have the, like, the actual object and then all of the uh, arguments that it receives on, on, on the message and so on. So I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion about programming in the debugger and also like um, how like if that's something that you do frequently when you are working with multiple development um, I don't think it has anything specifically do with multiple development but sometimes you're in a situation where um, the only way to get the information get at the information that you need is to put a breakpoint somewhere and it's very often a um, and uh, what's the best word, the uh, conditional breakpoint. So you put in a conditional breakpoint somewhere so you can get in the right context, which is both live and you can access the code and the state, because sometimes it's the only way you can get there. And then, then you can continue working there. But I think you do that less than uh, coding from an inspector with a moldable object. We also, the debugger itself is also heavily moldable, so you can do all sorts of wildly crazy things there. I haven't personally experimented with it, so I can't tell you much, but I, I know that uh, for, uh, for some of the work in Fink, uh, there are quite a few debugger extensions. And that was one of, so I'm, uh, a lot of these ideas came from Andre Kish's PhD thesis. And uh, one of my favorite examples, he had many different multiple tools, but my favorite examples were the ones he had for uh, multiple debuggers. Uh, for example, so two examples that come to mind is if you're debugging uh, an event-driven application, 
You don't want the stack view. What you want is you want to jump to a particular event that's happening. So you want to move the step ahead button or the, the buttons that allow you to move in the execution. Same thing is if you're debugging a parser. You don't want to go to the next stack thread. You want to go to the next rule in the parser. And that's also a relatively simple adaptation of the debugger. That's so effective. If you're working with a generic tool, a generic debugger, it's just painful. If you can mold that thing in a small way, it can be so much more effective. Talking about the debugger, uh, would you mind just because I imagine when I started working with this with GT, probably I would make multiple mistakes. I would see that screen where you have a doesn't understand. I'm sure I would see that. So could you show us just a little bit how the debugger looks like? Like if we go go back to what you're talking about. Really. Okay. So this is an example. And I don't debug examples too often, but for I do. Let, let, let's try and add her gear. Tell the little problem here with your mouse. Ah, there we go. So now we're inside the debugger. Um, but it was complaining about the, uh, and now we have to run a hand. Oh, where did it go? There it is. So it was, it was that it does not understand. And I don't understand why the announcer method is missing. So it's in a link. Uh, so here's the link guide and the link is a markdown web page. Um, and as I recall, the Markdown web page should be inheriting from uh, a web page. And it should have an announcer. It doesn't seem to, but let's go to the superclass. And the superclass is a web page. And the web page should have an announcer. And why doesn't it? And it's not using any trace. So this is kind of weird. Is this... Okay, so I need to go to tell you what I wanted to see. I tried yeah. to see how the body look like. So that's as far as I got at the moment. So I don't know if it should have an announcer because uh, because I think it should. And why is that missing? Because this example was working before I left for Argentina. No, no, my it just I wanted to see the body. So that's that's enough for me. Yeah, there there are also other things here. So these guys are 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 moldable. So you can see the stack, you can see the receiver, you can add other things here, you can mold the the actions that are performed, and you can add different kinds of views here. So remember we have the, the little button at the top to allow us to switch from the list of methods that uh, we found in the system in the query to an inspector view. Uh, you can also add different views of the debugger itself. Again, I haven't played with that at all, but I know. Uh, I know it's there. It's sort of at the limit of what I was uh, working. It wasn't relevant to what I was working on, so I haven't explored that anymore. But that's more or less the way things work. It's pretty, mostly pretty traditional. But there is some molding that I did that wasn't relevant for this example. Uh, yeah, we're one minute into twelve o'clock. As I said, I'll be here all week. Tomorrow I'll be here for Camp Small Talk. I'd be happy to go one on one or in tiny groups if people would like to see more of the of the environment or talk about anything. And on Wednesday at the end of the day, as I said, uh, I'll try and do a workshop and I'll take I'll offer two examples. One's more greenfield, probably stack machine, and the other one is where we're wrapping existing data and trying to build multiple views on that. And uh, rather than having everybody download G toolkit at the same time. I would recommend if you're interested in it, uh, either for tomorrow or especially on Wednesday, to try and download it in advance where your system runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. So either Intel or for bottom ground. Core.com. And we're best. Great. Thanks very much.